what is policy evaluation. Um, I'm Glenn Neal, I'm from the Evidence for Policy and Practice Information and Coordinating Centre. Bit of a mouthful, so it's the Epi Centre or Epic Centre. Um, the thing about the policy evaluation session is it's really, I think everyone's got their own ideas about what policy is um, and how it works. And this is maybe why we don't see government departments necessarily working together, because they might have their own ideas of what policy is. But here I'm really about um, trying to cover, um, sum well, summarise a few ideal models, if you like, around policy evaluation. And really this, is, uh, this session for me is about covering the breadth, not depth. Um, and I suppose rather than looking at a particular method, we're also looking more at a particular question and thinking how we can evaluate policy. Um, so I'm going to start with a uh, Oxford English definition of policy and of evaluation. Um, so it, the definition of policy is that it's the art, study or practice of government or administration. And the definition of evaluation is that it's the action or, of appraising or valuing goods a calculation or statement of value. And I had to look at these and I thought, oh, is that it then? Is that the end of the session? That is policy evaluation. And then I kind of thought about it a bit more and I had a bit of a problem, um, a little bit with the definition of policy. Um, it doesn't really cover the influence of practitioners and the way that practitioners influence policy, um, develop policy, implement policy and influence policy from the bottom up. Um, but mainly as well with the definition of valuation, the action of appraising or valuing goods, thinking about what works. And actually for me, uh, a very important question is also what happened um, and thinking about um, actually um, whether things are implemented in a correct way. So I think that the, together um, they don't quite work and hopefully we'll get to a, a better definition of what policy evaluation is later in the session. For me, it's really important that we arm decision makers with the evidence of what works, for whom, when and where. Um, and there's very important reasons for doing this. This again might be um, uh, quite um, intuitive, but um, it's really important that we support uh, decision makers to make judicious choices on the basis of the best available analysis and evidence. Um, so in doing so, we hope to support um, better um, or more effective policies. Um, it supports transparency in decision making. So getting um, the evaluation evidence into policy making makes it a much more transparent process, makes the policy process a much more participatory process. It improves accountability. We can see why and how um, decisions were arrived at and makes it a much more democratic process as well. And really, um, from a policymaker perspective, particularly in these times of austerity, um, hopefully as well, um, evidence-based policy and practice based on rigorous evaluation can um, lead to cost-effective uh, policies being put into place. Um, so the next question is really about when, um, evaluate, when should policy evaluation take place? And I really wanted to try and emphasise that for me this is a very um, continuous process, not just a kind of post hoc um, after implementation. So this diagram has stretched my PowerPoint um, uh, abilities to the limit, but just starting at the top, um, we've got the kind of identification of the, the needs, so thinking about what the challenge is, developing the solutions and ideas for solution, moving to developing the policy, the implementation, and then some policy monitoring, maybe some refinement of the policy, and then to, um, thinking again whether there's a remaining need or whether the need has changed. And at each of these steps, I think there's evaluative thinking and an evaluative approach should be occurring. Um, and actually this is, um, I think for a number of years now, for decades in fact, that um, this idea that evaluation should be um, at each stage of the policy process is something that's been talked about a lot, but is still something that's lacking um, in government um, at the moment, and um, from all uh, levels of government, from top to local government. So in a recent survey in uh, um, 2010 um, of ministers and civil servants, evaluation scored bottom in terms of comparing how policy is um, done compared to how policy should be done and actually the thing that scored top was that policy was outward looking. Um, so the types of questions we might want to ask at these different points are thinking about what is the policy challenge, 
what the, what's the policy meant to do, how big is the challenge, um, and then moving to how the policy is meant to work. So after we've developed some ideas, what's the policy meant to do? Um, then thinking about gathering evidence um, for the policy, and this is something that the EPI Centre is um, really involved in doing. So thinking about what, um, whether the policies worked elsewhere, um, how it's worked, um, and so on. Then thinking about more kind of feasibility and implementation questions. So thinking, trying to really early on identify the barriers, the facilitators, um, the resources that might be needed to put a policy into place. Um, then moving on to the implementation, thinking about what works, and then thinking about whether the effects are um, equitable, whether there are any negative effects um, as a result of the policy, and then moving on to the kind of um, how the policy was implemented, what actually happened, and then um, finally, this is um, definitely not the least important, but then thinking about whether the policy was cost effective. Um, so I'm going to go through some of these questions uh, in sequence and highlight some of the methods that are around to support some of these questions. So beginning with the, how the policy is meant to work, um, I suppose this, um, this is the first step really in terms of evaluating um, policy and interventions and really it's about establishing a shared understanding of the policy goals, the purpose and the intended outcomes. Um, this should really, I said should be a re, um, first step, but actually it isn't present in um, all policies. But um, developing the theory, we've got two main approaches really. We've got uh, logic models um, that, um, uh, that represent a causal chain of assumptions. Both these actually are very graphic based, um, I've got some examples. But logic models, they're kind of causal chains of assumption. So you really start with where you want, where you, what your outcome is, where you, what you want the policy to achieve, and then you work back and think about what the logical assumptions are to actually reach that goal. And the theory of change is a very um, similar um, technique, but it's much more, it has much more explicit accounts of the processes and indicators and the actual theories underlying the mechanisms. Um, and the mechanisms underlying the theories. Um, so this is an example um, from a study at the moment that I'm working with in a systematic review. Um, it's uh, a policy that was implemented to try and improve um, levels of asthma among school children. Um, the policy, um, it, was, it took place in Birmingham in Alabama. The context was that there were very high levels of um, asthma and the policymakers were really looking for a way of improving asthma outcomes and trying to foster um, self-management among children, trying to get m children to manage their own asthma. Um, the design was a randomised control trial across the whole school system. And this is what the logic model for that um, particular evaluation looked like at the top. So this is how it was meant to work. So they, their goal was to improve um, levels of school absences and decrease levels of hospitalisation. To do that, they thought that they needed to improve children's symptomology. To get to that point, they thought that they needed to increase and improve children's knowledge of asthma. To do that, they wanted teachers to integrate um, self-management into general school curriculum. To get to that point, they wanted to te um, train teachers, and that was the basic design of the intervention. And what actually happened? Oh, uh, children's symptoms, so their asthma, um, so experience of nighttime or daytime asthma symptoms. Um, the so what actually happened in that case um, was. They actually failed at the very first uh, run. They didn't actually manage to train the teachers. Um, they, the teachers themselves were too busy um, and wouldn't actually get engaged. Um, that then led uh, to separate asthma classes being um, uh, undertaken, which only led to moderate improvements in children's knowledge. They weren't able to actually measure whether children's asthma symptoms had improved because parents refused to take place. And this led to no change in the level of school asthma. And but this kind of notion of a logic model is, um, quite a, uh, is a good first step to try and think about what the policy is meant to achieve. Um, and they can actually uh, get quite complex. This is an example from the same systematic review that I'm working on at the moment. Um, and this is a, I'm not going to go through it, it's far too detailed, but just to kind of um, show really that 
um, the, there's potential for incorporating quite complex, um, a lot of complexity within these. Um, I'm then going to I'm now going to move on to the, the kind of um, the bread and butter actually of what the epicenter is about, um, and think about what is the evidence that the policies worked uh, elsewhere or earlier. Um, here I've got this actually looks a little bit like a hierarchy of evidence and. Um, I have actually have a few of these diagrams throughout the presentation. Um, they're not always kind of helpful or, or correct to actually grade evidence in this way, but a lot of policymakers do um, grade evidence in terms of the strength, uh, the validity, um, whether it's free of bias, um, whether it's better evidence for inferring causality. So systematic review evidence in terms of um, whether the policies worked elsewhere te often is put at the top of the... Um, um, the pyramid as being the strongest evidence um, of causality and so um, and then moving down um, a systematic review maybe without RCTs then moving to more scoping reviews and at the bottom here some less structured methods um, that are used often by policy makers so for example calls for evidence. Um, I've got a description of a systematic review here. Um, this is uh, by Goff and colleagues in my department. But I also like Ben Goldacre's description of a systematic review. And he says that instead of just mooching through the lit research literature consciously or unconsciously, picking out papers here and there to support our pre-existing beliefs, we take a scientific, systematic approach to the very process of looking for scientific evidence ensuring that our evidence is as complete and representative as possible of all the research that has ever been done. Um, and, so, um, and just to kind of focus in on the systematic reviews, they, they can um, be used to evaluate the strength of evidence um, and also uncover new findings. Um, this here is a forest plot. This is... Um, this is uh, well, one of the basis of um, quantitative synthesis in, uh, meta, in um, systematic reviews. Um, this shows the individual, um, so each one of these points is an individual study, um, an individual randomised control trial that was carried out. Um, it shows the strength of effect and also the level of precision. Um, these, were, these are then synthesised into an overall effect. And this particular forest plot is for an intervention called Scared Straight. Um, it involved children going into, who are at risk of uh, juvenile delinquency going into um, prisons and, um, and uh, meeting prisoners and basically being scared to death that they wouldn't actually, to the point where they wouldn't actually um, commit crimes. Um, and individually, each of the studies were, either gave inconclusive findings or there were some um, that actually suggested a negative trend, but together there was a very clear evidence that the, um, that the intervention actually, help, uh, actually was negative for young people and doing nothing was actually more effective in, getting, uh, in stopping young people from committing further crime than actually um, this particular programme. So scaring people like this doesn't, doesn't actually work. Um, but nevertheless, it became policy in 2003, around the same time that this was um, published, and it was signed into uh, legislation by the then, then Illinois governor, Rod Blagovich. Um, who's actually now in prison uh, himself for corruption. Um, so, uh, but this um, evidence showed that actually scaring children, making them cry like this, doesn't work. Um, the next question we might think about is how feasible the policy is in a particular population. Again, there's kind of like this um, a kind of pyramid, if you like, or, of ways of going about this. So we might start at the bottom with the less reliable methods in terms of consultative activities. Then we might move on to a range of different methods around kind of evaluative research. So trying to scope out um, some, of these um, some of these questions beforehand before actually moving on to the piloting and the feasibility um, studies. Um, so, um, but the main, um, the main thing that uh, we want to get from these kind of um, exercises are to identify the barriers and facilitators, to think whether the um, particular policy is applicable to our area, so whether the needs in the local area um, match the policy, 
whether um, the policy is transferable and um, thinking about issues of acceptability. Um, I'm going to just skip this slide um, and then think about the types of questions. So I've got five minutes left-ish um, and uh, think about the types of questions and the types of policy evaluation we might undertake post hoc, so after implementation. Um, so we've got uh, different questions here. So the process evaluation, thinking about what was actually done, what happened, did it go to plan, impact evaluations, um, did the policy make a difference, um, so what works, if you like, um, the economic evaluations, taking an economic lens onto what works, um, and then the experiential evaluation. And this question actually doesn't do justice, this is how did it make people feel, but actually there's a lot more to experiential evaluations as well, and thinking about some of the negative effects, um, and could be, they can be a good effective way of identifying negative effects here. Um, there is, I've got a slide here about um, what happened. So this is about kind of process evaluations. I'm going to just um, touch on this a little bit because I think um, they're neglected really in the literature. So the evaluation of outcomes tells you if a policy works, but if a policy worked. But you also need to know whether that's due to the implementation or the design of the policy. Process evaluations can help to shed some light on this. Um, they can give a, a detailed account of what happened. Um, some com common components are levels of attrition, dosage, adherence, reach, whether the policy was adapted in any way, levels of satisfaction, and they can also give you a detailed understanding of the context in which the policy was undertaken. Um, they can be used to give an assessment of overall feasibility, um, they can be sometimes used as well to establish whether there's a dose-response relationship, so whether more of the intervention actually leads to better outcomes. Um, and this example here gives a, a, is an interesting example. I've got it in the references, but it actually um, found very little dose-response relationship for some outcomes, um, although not for others. And this here, the, so there's been a lot of calls, particularly in the medical literature actually, but around that process evaluations should be undertaken as standard along policy um, implementation, trial literature and policy literature. But actually these calls have gone um, fairly unanswered. Um, the what works question, probably the most um, interesting and important question. Um, we're looking at a family of different approaches here. Um, thinking, they're usually thought of in terms of quantitative but not always. Um, and really going towards um, more of a, a culture of mixed methods evaluation for large complex policies. Um, in terms of the quantitative methods, again we can start with more rudimentary methods if you like around performance management, seeing whether targets were met, but then to more, um, more uh, complex methods in terms of trying to understand the impact of a policy. Um, I think I've got about two minutes left, uh, which is um, shocking because I'm going to just go through this, um, the slide around counterfactuals. So really the counterfactual is about um, assessing really, trying to get at the nub of the, the answer of what would happen if a policy wasn't put into place. So the essential um, component is that we're trying to measure the difference between tr um, being treated by the policy and um, what happened to those who didn't receive the policies of the comparison or control conditions. The counterfactual treatment should have the same characteristics at the baseline and also if you're looking across different policies they should be um, equivalent in terms of the no, um, no additional treatment or no, um, no intervention. Um, and what we're trying to see is whether the difference was due to policy. Um, again, we've got um, a kind of hierarchy, if you like, so we start with the experimental methods and whether um, the policy was randomised um, across different individuals or areas, moving towards quasi-experimental methods, um, uh, trying to, again, infer causality, but um, not necessarily with randomisation occurring, and then down to non-experimental methods, and these are basically asking um, stakeholders whether they think the policy made a difference and whether what would have happened so more kind of views if you like um, there's a lot of different quasi experimental approaches um, so we've got different um, 
I'll leave these now because I've got a couple of, minutes, uh, couple of minutes, but um, basically they're trying to refine the estimate of the counterfactual. They're trying to sit, understand but, um, and infer causality so, um, and trying to attribute the differences to the impact of the intervention. Um, RCTs are seen as the gold standard in a lot of cases um, because the, uh, the policy is randomised and they, um, so we eliminate or reduce the impact of selection bias. They're not necessarily infallible. Um, forms of bias can be introduced. They're very difficult to carry out um, in terms of implementation, resources, and there are some um, cases where it might not necessarily be ethical to randomise policy, or it might be just very, very difficult from a practitioner perspective. Um, very common in health, not necessarily so elsewhere. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, a recent systematic review by Oliver and colleagues really tried to uh, make the case that policy evaluations should adopt randomised designs wherever possible um, because of the differential um, effect sizes that you see. Um, I'll skip this. Uh, the one thing here I wanted to touch on um, was that even though we might talk about hierarchies of evidence in terms of the validity and um, the ability to infer causality of um, policy, actually what policy makers might turn towards more is things like expert opinion, um, local evaluations which might be less robust, or um, evaluations carried out in-house again which might be less robust, and public opinion and research evidence might be down here. And there are good reasons why, um, so in terms of accessibility, relevance and salience of some of these more in uh, robust methods. Um, so I'll get, to the, I'll get to the point now. Um, so what is a policy evaluation? For me it's a broad set, set of methods investigating a range of questions about the purpose, justification, feasibility, outcomes and impact, experience and economic costs and benefits of policy. And for me, what makes a good policy evaluation is that it speaks to all the stages um, of the policy cycle. Um, it involves the most robust methods available to address um, the particular questions. It may involve mixed methods, particularly for more complex policy evaluations. Um, it provides information across groups who are impacted, um, so it can address equity questions and um, can uh, considers and can measure negative impacts as well as the original purpose. Um, and in terms of the evidence, the evidence should be um, useful and usable for decision makers. Um, I think at the moment it's quite an exciting time to be thinking about policy evaluation. I think the theme of this um, conference is about administrative data and um, the availability and flourishing data. So there's a lot more um, to be done using secondary um, data analysis to evaluate um, the impacts of policy. We've also seen a, a growing network of um, what works centres so across a number of policies that are sponsored by the ESRC, as well as a number of other organisations that are very active in, um, in conducting policy evaluations. Uh, and some references here. So uh, thank you, apologies, that was a bit hurried.